Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com. This is St. Louis on the Air from St. Louis Public Radio. I'm Elaine Cha. You can, uh, as I read the opinion, Uh, refuse to provide those expressive services to any person or group based on any kind of animus you might have. Uh, And yet we can have someone say that uh, the COVID vaccine uh, causes autism without any basis in fact. I guess someone could say that, you know, our attorney general is a member of a secret society controlled by aliens. I don't have to really prove it. At what point does the government cross the line The First Amendment has everyday impact in our lives, and the boundaries of free expression have long been a subject of legal debate. In the last two weeks, there have been two major federal-level developments with cases that involve whether a business owner can discriminate against LGBTQ people and whether the government can communicate with social media companies. There are real-life ramifications in these cases and connections to Missouri. Here to talk about it is Greg McGarrian, law professor and First Amendment scholar at Washington University. Greg, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Greg, give us a brief overview of these two cases, and let's start with the case involving social media and government coercion. So Andrew Bailey is touting victory over, quote, the biggest violation of the First Amendment in our nation's history. The the decision... Uh, from a federal judge in Louisiana, was announced on all days, July 4th, Independence Day. What did that decision say, Greg? Well, this is an order from a federal district judge that basically prohibits a wide range of Biden administration officials from communicating with social media platforms about uh, content and, and encouraging uh, or urging, let alone coercing, the social media platforms to to take down content that the government has a problem with. Mm-hmm. And was that at all surprising? I mean, what stood out to you about the ruling from Judge Terry Doty? It's very surprising. It's it's a very broad injunction. Uh, now. Uh, Attorney General Bailey's uh, proclamation of victory may be a little bit premature. The Biden administration has appealed the order, uh, has asked for a stay of the order pending appeal. Uh, but it is it is a very sweeping and consequential order. And I don't know of any precedent uh, like this where a court has essentially told the government you can't uh, even communicate with – a speech provider of some kind to encourage or urge or give the government's point of view about whether certain content should be available. So this is just any contact whatsoever? It's contact uh, if the government is, is again, urging or encouraging removal of, of First Amendment protected speech. Mm-hmm. And the arbiter of that would be? Well, the arbiter of that would would ultimately be a court. It's it's a little bit of a difficult injunction to enforce in that uh, if the government and the person, the contact of the social media platform wanted to have the conversation, no one else is necessarily on the line or in the room when that conversation happens. Right. Uh, but if there is evidence of, of a communication like that, then then the arbiter of this would, would be the judge uh, to enforce the injunction. And is it part of the the issue here about a chilling effect? That's the concern that the attorneys general who brought the case raised. That's the concern that the order reflects. It's not entirely clear to me whether there is very much evidence that that concern is warranted in this case. Mm -hmm. Uh, When we talk about the First Amendment and free speech protection, concern about chilling protected speech is a very familiar theme. We don't want the government doing things, even indirectly, that might lead people to self-censor. But in this instance, we're talking about the uh, biggest, best endowed uh, players in the marketplace of ideas, social media platforms who employ platoons of lawyers and policy analysts and who are pretty capable of taking care of themselves. So mm-hmm. the likelihood of, of, of chilling of expression at that level seems a, a little bit fanciful to me. Yeah. 
Do you have questions about censorship and the government? I'd like to invite you into the conversation. If you have a question or comment about this topic, please give us a call at 314-382-8255. That's 382-TALK. Or you can send us a tweet at STL on air or email us at talk at stlpr.org. Now, Andrew Bailey is making strong statements. This is the attorney general here in Missouri. He's making strong statements about what this case means, like here in this July 6th interview on Fox News. Well, I think we need to erect a wall of separation between tech and state to protect Americans' First Amendment rights from President Biden and his army of federal bureaucrats who seek to undermine free speech in the United States of America. And that wall began being erected on July 4th when the judge laid the first brick by issuing this preliminary injunction. We're now going to get to the merits of the case, continue doing discovery, receive more documents, conduct more depositions, and root out this vast censorship enterprise that President Biden has constructed. That's a relationship of both coercion and collusion with big tech social media. And that was Attorney General Andrew Bailey, who is one of the the people who brought the suit that led to this ruling. What do you make of what we just heard? A couple of things. Uh, I think it's important to understand that this is a highly politically charged uh, case and dispute. The attorneys general who are bringing these claims are uniformly Republican attorneys general. The judge in issuing the order made a point of saying that the problem was censorship of conservative speech. And in his words, that was very telling. This has been a theme on the right for a long time that, that, that conservative speech is being censored. It doesn't really seem to occur to these uh, uh, concerned attorneys general, uh, or at least they don't talk about this possibility, that some of the speech being uh, uh, excised from these social media platforms may actually be false, pernicious, misleading, may present problems that the social media platforms of their own initiative uh, would would want to, to get off their platforms. Right, right. So we have Jerry from O'Fallon calling with a question. Jerry, welcome to St. Louis on the Air. Good afternoon. Uh, I guess my, um, well, not really question, but does the First Amendment protect my right to say I'm selling you a car that gets 100 miles per gallon when it doesn't? Uh, you know, it's false. You know, false advertising can result in civil and criminal penalties. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yet we can have someone say that uh, the COVID vaccine uh, causes autism without any basis in fact. Uh, I guess someone could say that, you know, our attorney general is a member of a secret society uh, that is uh, controlled by aliens. I don't have to really prove it, yeah. but it's out there. Yeah. It's a great question. So there, there's sort of a legalistic piece to what I'll say and, and a, a broader piece. The legalistic piece is you're absolutely right. And in fact, the First Amendment gives somewhat less protection to commercial speech than, for example, political speech. So, yeah, there, there are fraud laws that prohibit lying about products you're offering for sale. The First Amendment does protect, to a certain extent, false speech uh, that isn't commercial. However, false speech of the sort that you're pointing out obviously causes problems and causes social harms. And so what we count on uh, when it comes to falsehoods and misleading expression, we count on intermediaries and arbiters like social media platforms to exercise some responsibility and to say, okay, we're not going to propagate this false speech because we know it's socially harmful. So the question in this case is, at what point does the government cross the line from just telling social media platforms, hey, folks, we think that some of this information you're putting out there is harmful? That, I think, is well within the government's legal prerogative. What's not within the government's legal prerogative would be to say, we will punish you, social media platforms, if you refuse to remove speech that we tell you to remove. Mm-hmm. In in, in Attorney General, uh, the Attorney General's statement, it's sort of telling that he said, uh, I think, compulsion and... Uh, you know, coercion and and collusion. It? Collusion, yeah, mm-hmm. and and those are two very different things. And the collusion <laughs> piece is not a First Amendment violation. If the government says, "Hey, anti-vax st- stuff on on Facebook is getting people killed," and Facebook says, "Yeah, we agree. Thanks for bringing that to our attention. We think we should do something about that." That's not a First Amendment violation. That's socially responsible uh, intermediation of speech. Mm-hmm. On this point, then, about the um, 
collusion, coercion. The ruling seems to imply from a tech company's side that the government requesting something of you means the government is forcing you to do something. And coercion means that it's something the tech company doesn't want. So you did, you talked about that a little bit more. Can you elaborate? Absolutely. It's a really, really important distinction. So let's take a step back. If the government makes a statement to you or me, to an ordinary person like, you know, you get a call from the Biden administration, hey, we just wanted to let you know that we didn't like what you said the other day. Okay, you might have reason to feel like the government's exercising coercive pressure on you, because that would be a very unusual communication with a relatively weak, you know, ordinary person who's not in a great position to, to resist if there were to be coercion. That might chill speech. When we're talking about giant social media platforms, giant corporations, and the government says, hey, we're gonna just tell you some of our concerns, those social media platforms know if they're being threatened and if they're not being threatened. They know where the government is coming from. If the government is pushing them improperly, trying to coerce them, they're in a good position to fight back. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, As far as I'm aware, there's not good evidence that that's what's been going on here. We're talking about some recent legal rulings with major implications for the First Amendment and the right to free expression. And we're talking with Greg Magarian, law professor and First Amendment scholar at Washington University. What is an example of clear-cut government censorship, and how does this case compare? Well, we let's let's take the classic example of uh, the McCarthy era, where and and it's actually a good example because in the McCarthy era, you know, the the, the big problem was private action, and and so it's a sort of parallel to what this case is about. The government urges a certain result. But in in that instance, uh, the House Un-American Activities Committee is essentially sending a very strong signal to, for example, Hollywood Studios, you don't employ these communists anymore. And the Hollywood Studios go along, not because they necessarily want to, uh, but because they understand that the government is exerting pressure over them. Mm -hmm. So that would be an analog to what's going on here, but the analogy breaks down pretty quickly yeah. uh, because we don't see that kind of strong arming, at least I'm not aware of it, from, from the government to the social media platforms. Yeah. Let's move to the second major legal decision involving the First Amendment. And this one was issued by the U.S. Supreme Court on June 30th and it involved a website designer in Colorado. Greg, tell us about that case and what the justices ruled there. This is a case that raises or advances a sort of longstanding tension, conflict between the First Amendment and federal and state anti-discrimination statutes. So uh, the federal government has the 1964 Civil Rights Act. States have various iterations of the same thing that, among other things, prohibit discrimination by uh, people, companies that provide public accommodations. Mm-hmm. Most obvious examples are restaurants and and uh, hotels being prohibited from discriminating based on race. Those statutes uh, have, have broadened over time to include discrimination uh, against different groups of people, so not just racial discrimination, but sex discrimination, and in many states, as in Colorado, sexual orientation discrimination. Mm-hmm. So this is about a website designer who said that she was interested in expanding her business into making websites for weddings, but she was concerned that under the Colorado anti-discrimination law, she would have to uh, sell her services to same-sex couples. And she is a conservative Christian who does not believe in the validity of same-sex marriage. Mm -hmm. And so the Supreme Court in this case sided with her and said that the First Amendment free speech clause, this is not a religion case legally, it's a speech Mm -hmm. case. The First Amendment free speech clause protects her against having to create websites and have them uh, available to same-sex couples. Yeah. So since this was in Colorado, you know, Colorado had a a non-discrimination law. What does it mean for states like Missouri? It applies across the board to any state that that has a non-discrimination law that includes sexual orientation. And, And more than that, as I said, it's not just a case about religion. It's not really just a case about sexual orientation either. This is a case about, again, the free speech clause of the First Amendment versus anti-discrimination principles. So under the logic of this decision, uh, if you are a provider of uh, exp- provider of goods or services that, that involves speech in some way, you can, uh, as I read the opinion, 
refuse to provide those expressive services to any person or group based on any kind of animus you might have, racial, uh, misogynistic, anti-homophobic, you know, whatever it might be, uh, because that would be a violation of your free speech rights. Right. Now, there is a Missouri connection to this SCOTUS case as well. The Alliance Defending Freedom, which is a, a Christian legal advocacy, advocacy group that represented website designer Lori Smith, included attorney Aaron Hawley. And Aaron Hawley is married to Republican U.S. Senator Josh Hawley. And Senator Hawley tweeted after the decision that he was proud of his wife for litigating the case. But there was also controversy about this ruling as it turned out that Smith, the website designer, had never actually received a request to design a website for a gay wedding or gay couple. And yet, as the AP or Associated Press reported, this revelation is unlikely to matter in the or to the ruling, that is, since the suit was brought as a, quote, pre-enforcement challenge. So it's a lot of info. But Greg, what's your take on this? And how could it not matter that this case, the entire thing is based on basically a hypothetical? Well, this is a remarkable case in, in a lot of ways. And, and this is one sense in which it's a remarkable case. As you said, the Supreme Court allowed this case to go forward based on the web designer's concern, anxiety that the state would if she went into this uh, wedding side of the business, that the state would enforce the anti-discrimination law against her. Um, there are certainly instances, other cases, in which the Supreme Court allows pre-enforcement challenges uh, to various laws uh, under the First Amendment. But usually those cases involve almost inevitable enforcement where the, the, the plaintiff, the challenger can say, hey, I'm actually engaged in this kind of speech and clearly this kind of speech is prohibited under the law. The state could reasonably argue in a, in a case like this, and I think did argue, uh, that you know we would not necessarily use our enforcement resources to go after someone who was uh, in this position doing this thing. That's within mm -hmm. the state's prerogative. Clearly, the Supreme Court wanted to decide this case, wanted to hand down this ruling, and so they uh, sort of stormed through the the, the barriers that, that ordinarily kind of define procedurally what they can do. Mm -hmm. Now, we had a listener call in to ask, what is the line between commercial and political speech? So if someone is running for office, aren't they trying to sell themselves to the voting public? Does that matter? That is a very sophisticated question. And in fact, it's been a big problem in First Amendment law. There is this separate doctrine dealing with so-called commercial speech. But one of the problems with the doctrine is that commercial speech is difficult to define. The way the court has defined it traditionally is speech that does nothing more than propose a commercial transaction, an exchange of goods or services for money. So under that definition, we can draw, I think, a meaningful distinction with classic political speech. The, the, the caller is absolutely right that in a meaningful sense, candidates are selling themselves, but they are not literally selling themselves for money, we hope, uh, in, yeah. in, in a way that's, that's exactly like a commercial transaction. Mm -hmm. Now, with the the case um, that we were just talking about, you, do you expect it to be challenged, and on what grounds? Well, the Supreme Court has handed down its ruling. I think what's actually going to happen is that we are now going to see a, 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 a series of lawsuits that try to expand upon this ruling. So again, this particular case is about a Christian conservative who does not want to provide services to same-sex couples getting married. But the implications of the case go further than that. So I don't know what the frontier of this will be, but there will certainly be instances of people coming out and saying, hey, we have we provide an expressive service or an expressive good, we should be able to discriminate against African Americans. We should be able to discriminate against immigrants. We should be able to discriminate against women. We should be able to discriminate against Jews uh, or maybe against Christians or maybe against men. Uh, but I think that's going to be the action going forward is mm -hmm. actually people stepping into the space the Supreme Court is open and trying to expand that space. And just as a, as a wrap up here in the last uh, couple of minutes, you know, what does this signal about um, what it is, people in Missouri, just to bring it very local, Missouri does not have anti-discrimination law 
uh, when it comes to LGBTQ people. So like this is sort of business as usual. I mean, what do you say to someone who feels like that? And yet, you know, you've talked about sort of the larger implications. I think one important thing about this is that Supreme Court decisions are a big deal socially and culturally and politically as well as legally. So one thing, and the dissenters in this case pointed out this idea, one thing that, that a Supreme Court decision like this does is, is to sort of signal, hey, it's okay to discriminate. It's respectable to discriminate. And I think that's going to be the effect in, in across the board and certainly in even in a place like Missouri that doesn't have, as you said, anti-discrimination law about sexual orientation. Mm. Greg McGarrion is a law professor and First Amendment scholar at Washington University. Thanks so much, Greg, for talking with us today. My pleasure. Thank you. This episode was produced by Danny Wissentowski. With audio engineering and podcast design by Aaron Dorr. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. St. Louis on the Air proudly supports local artists by using music from Life Creative Group. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thank you. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com.